Hey guys, what's up? This right here is my test bench, and on my test bench, I have my brand new Xeon E5 2695V3. So that is a Xeon 14 core CPU, 14 cores, 28 threads. I have 32 gigs of ECC registered DDR4 in quad channel. So this undoubtedly is a server workstation machine. It's got a server board that doesn't even have a power switch on it, so you actually have to just turn on the power supply and the board turns on. It's got a workstation CPU that is a 14 core Xeon, and it's got workstation memory, I guess you would call it, which is ECC registered, which can only be used in boards that support registered DIMMs. So, with this workstation PC that is really meant to get some solid work done, we're going to test gaming performance today, and and of course we do need a graphics card, so we're obviously going to go with the Titan X Pascal. Yes, Titan X Pascal, not Titan XP Pascal, which apparently is a different freaking card, and I'm mad now because that's stupid, but that's besides the point. So, paired with a Titan X Pascal, not to be confused with Titan X Maxwell or probably Titan P P P P T. We're going to test the gaming performance of this CPU. So we're going to do it in typical card testing fashion where we just hop into the games and I talk over it because that's interesting or something. And, uh, and that's really it. So basically the only thing I want to show you is if I can find my display port is that literally to turn on this PC, like I said, this is a server motherboard. So it's meant to be basically running all the time with like redundant power supplies in a server and stuff like that. So basically if you just turn on the power supply, the board turns on. It's none of that, you know, there's no power switch. So I can't really even put this in a case to make a build that's like meant to be turned on and off or even use it like for something cool. Um, because it, it just turns on with the power supply and turns off with the power supply. And that's a really terrible way to turn on and off a PC when it's meant to be running all the time. And it's got that cool beeping. But without further ado, so we're going to get into the games. A couple things that I will note. I will be using GPU encoding, um, which is fine because the GPU will not be the bottleneck here. Hopefully the CPU will be, unless it really is a lot better than I thought. Uh, in terms of specs of the CPU, it's a 14 core, 28 thread Xeon uh, with a 2.3 gigahertz base and a 3.3 gigahertz boost. But you'll notice that in games that it's not really boosting to 3.3 or even into the threes, and that's because that's likely a one to four core boost. So when it's under load any more than you know four cores or one to four, it'll boost to its all core boost, which is about 2.8, 2.9, which is still pretty decent. And of course we had a double boot here, so we get double beeps. Now, the last thing I did say in the original video about the CPU is I was gonna test Premiere Pro performance, and my goal was to actually edit this video in Premiere Pro and render it and stuff like that using the CPU uh, to do, and that would be the test, because I thought that would be pretty cool. Um, but no, it's it's bad. It, it literally, it has trouble scrubbing in a 1080p timeline, so that's just, that's a no-go. That's uh, just, no, not, not even gonna happen. Uh, it is much worse than my 3900X, despite having two more cores, so we'll just get that out of the way. But for gaming, I think you'll be surprised, but that's not the point. Let's hop right into the games, starting with Rainbow Six Siege. Yes, I know, I don't really play this game too often, but it I for a CPU test, I think it's a perfect game. It's kind of like uh, CSGO in the sense that it's a CPU bottleneck game very often, especially on the lower graphical settings, and you can actually run it on pretty low-end systems, and a lot of people buy systems just to play this game on PC, but this CPU, it runs over 200 FPS which is insane. Now, I will remind you that the games will not be scaling across 14 cores, okay? That's not how games work. They will maximum scale against maybe four to six max is the amount of cores that they will use. Rainbow Six Siege did excellent. I mean, we're running over 200 FPS on a 2.8 gigahertz CPU. That's what it was running throughout the entire test. You can see the GPU doesn't hit 100%, so the CPU is definitely the bottleneck. And you were definitely seeing its maximum gaming performance here at th almost 300 FPS at some parts is insane and it was smooth. The frame timing was also pretty good and everything was just really smooth. It was one of the smoothest gaming experiences I've ever had on a PC. Even compared to some of my newer CPUs, this was amazing. Action. 
Alright, moving on to Red Dead Redemption 2, and I was actually pretty surprised at our performance here. I ran on all medium settings, and we're getting about 90 to 100 FPS. Now, I will say, and you've probably noticed that the Titan X at some points is at like 99, 100% usage. That's because this game is just so horribly unoptimized for PC, but at the points where it's not even at 100% usage, the FPS only drops in like the 80s and 90s, so the performance here is again very surprising, and the performance was extremely smooth, so the frame timings were perfect. It, honestly, everything was fine here. I even went into the, you know, tavern that I usually go into to get some NPCs, because typically those take up CPU usage, etc, etc. Uh, you get the point, and it was good. This was a good experience. Not really much else to say, except Besides the card doing a lot more than it really should on medium settings in any game, uh, this game is very unoptimized and it performed fine for a 14 core CPU from 2014. Okay, moving on to probably one of the most CPU bottleneck games that's currently out, just because it doesn't use as many cores, because I mean it is a DirectX 9 game, and it came out in 2012, obviously it's CSGO, so, first of all, the FPS is alright, now as you notice, MSI Afterburner is disabled because CSGO basically has this new thing with anti-cheat where you can't have like any programs open that interact with the game, so no MSI Afterburner, but we do have our FPS in the bottom right, and wow. 2-300 to 300 on train, okay, not the most amazing FPS I've ever seen. For some reason, and I was thinking this when I was playing it, and I'm thinking it now, I'm like, this was one of the smoothest gaming experiences on CSGO I have ever had. My main PC, and this is partially due to SLI being, you know, micro stutters, all that garbage, is not as smooth as this. This was just extremely smooth for the FPS provided. Like, I, I'm using a 144Hz monitor here, but it was just so nice. The, the frame timing and pacing was just great. It was, it was so smooth, and I haven't felt like this since I played on my old Razer laptop. That's when it felt this smooth. Like, this was, it was amazing to play like this. Uh, it, it, it felt like the time when I first got my 1080 Ti 7700K pre-built, and I upgraded from a GT640, um, and a, a 4770 was my original gaming PC I played this on, I had to overclock the graphics card to play at 1080p. This was awesome. The CPU was clearly the bottleneck here, because I'm, uh, Titan X Pascal is not gonna be bottlenecked by CSGO in any sense of the word, but... This was just great. I, I was absolutely surprised. This was amazing. And for a Xeon, a 14 core, and it's only going to be using like two cores scaling across them. This was super smooth gameplay. I'm gonna skip the next few games because they were boring and stupid and I don't like them and I also failed at recording Warzone, but I played Warzone and I was actually getting like 100 FPS average, which is great for Warzone, and Far Cry 5, again, and, and Hitman 2, they were all pretty much the same. And I don't want to make this video 20 minutes like some of my other videos, so I'm gonna move right on to the last game, which is GTA 5, which again, old game, Rockstar, yada yada, they're doing it again because 
why not make a new game when you could just use the old one 50 times. But, uh, happy to report the car it performs fine. Uh, around 100 FPS, dropping as low as 70 at some points. But besides that, I mean, even blowing up cars and all that stuff, it's just an awesome gaming experience. Now, I this, unlike some of my other graphics card reviews like the RX 480 and stuff, this isn't a CPU where I'm like, oh, I can recommend it, go out and buy it. This was just, I wanted to test the gaming performance on a 14 core Xeon. A lot of people wanted me to do it, and I wanted to do it for myself, because I paid for the thing, I'm going to test it in gaming, because that's what it's meant for, clearly. Ah, uh, then kidding, it's not meant for that. I don't know, I'm considering running maybe like a Minecraft server off it or something like that. Uh, thinking about what I can do there, I don't know. Uh, I've got a lot of options with it, because there's a 14 core, 28 thread CPU, you can do a lot of things with that. On a server motherboard with 32 gigs of ECC memory, but that's, that's the point. Um, thank you guys so much for watching, so obviously it performed way better than I thought it would. I'll leave you guys, as I usually do, with the rest of GTA 5, because I find it to be the most interesting game. Thank you guys so much for watching, I love you guys, I'll see you in the next one. Peace.